Chief Prison Officer Killed in Auto Accident Protests Erupt Over Mingo's Arrest Former TIGI Head Sues EPA Over Illegal Permits In the Region Masks Soon Mandatory in Trinidad and Tobago And Internationally Portland Protests Mayor Blames Trump After Shooting Greetings and welcome to another edition of Channel 2 Headline News Update. I am George Gonzalves. Thank you for joining us. This morning, 38-year-old Chief Prison Officer Prince Cox was killed in an auto accident on Homestretch Avenue. Cox of Nabacalos, East Coast Demerara, was a passenger of a car along with two junior prison officers, one of which was the driver of the car. His name has not yet been released to the public. According to police, the collision occurred as the prison officer was attempting to overtake a vehicle on the road. However, the sudden lane change is what brought the car into the path of the oncoming SUV. Three people, including the lone driver of the SUV, are currently receiving medical treatment at the Georgetown Public Hospital, while Cox was declared dead on arrival. Protests erupted in Berbice over the weekend. The demonstrators were calling for the immediate release of Claremont Domingo. Here's Bibi Backus with that story. Residents of Belladrum, West Coast Burbies, have been protesting over the past three days demanding the release of returning officer of Region 4, Claremont Mingo. Over the weekend, the police officially charged Mingo with four counts of fraud in relation to the March 2nd elections after holding him in custody since Tuesday. The protesters have been using a number of items to block the area's roadway, including vehicles, burning debris, and even physically moving a shop onto the asphalt. The situation continued into the night, significantly affecting the road traffic in the region. It was at this point that officers made a decision to shoot tear gas and rubber bullets towards the crowd in an effort to disperse the group. According to Acting Commissioner of Police Nigel Hoppy, one protester was shot by a projectile and others were injured, including a police officer. For Headline News Update, Bibi Marcus. Thanks, Bibi. On Monday, Claremont Mingo was slapped with four charges of misconduct in public office relating to the March 2nd general and regional elections. The bail totals $600,000. Mingo also has to lodge his passport and report to the police every Friday at 9 a.m. He is slated to reappear in court on September 25th, 2020. However, Mingo was not the only GCOM employee who faced the courts today. Mingo's assistant, Sheffern February, was slapped with two charges of conspiracy to commit fraud. She was granted $300,000 bail. She will reappear in court on September 25th. However, February was also ordered to surrender her passport and was instructed to report to the CID headquarters every day. And lastly, GCOM IT officer Enrique Liven was charged with one count of fraud relating to the March 2nd general and regional elections. He was granted $150,000 bail. As condition for bail, he was ordered to lodge his passport and report to CID headquarters daily. He also has to stay 50 feet away from witnesses in the case. Liven is also expected back in court on September 25th. Stick around, coming up after the break, police find missing auto parts on the East Coast and former TIGI head sues EPA over illegal permits. Spelling, phonics, reading, and the National Grade 6 assessments. 
For more information, you can inbox us or call us. Contact us on 675-4379. I don't call them, no. Hidden treasures, discovering gems in young minds. Welcome back. Dr. Troy Thomas, the former head of Transparency International Guyana, is suing the EPA for issuing to Exxon Mobil permits which are in violation of EPA regulations. EPA's regulation number 19 limits the issuance of permits to five years. The permit for Lisa Phase 1, however, was granted for 23 years and 7 months, while the permit for Lisa Phase 2 was granted for 24 years. Dr. Thomas is asking the courts to cancel the environmental permits and instruct the EPA to issue corrected permits and prohibit the issuance of permits for longer than five years. Police on the East Coast have located a number of stolen auto parts. Esther Sober tells us more in this report. On Friday last, police were able to identify remains of a stolen car belonging to Tyrone Prasad, a taxi driver who was hijacked by a gunman on July 11th at Friendship East Bank Demerara. Parts of the car was discovered in a forest area at St. Cuthbert Mission, Mahaika River Region 4. The police were also able to identify other cars missing car parts as they await for the owners to positively identify them. According to reports, investigators had received information about some car parts and a glass bearing a taxi logo discarded at an area in a St. Cuthbert's mission and headed to the location with Prasad. After arriving, Prasad was able to identify his four car seats, a panel, his car windscreen, exhaust, and his driving shaft. The other unidentified parts are remains of a silver-colored Toyota Fielder and a Permio. The police investigation is ongoing. For Channel 2 Headline News, Esther Silver. Thanks, Esther. Don't go away. Coming up after the break, COVID-19 in Latin America, medics protest work conditions, and Portland protests. Mayor blames Trump after shooting. Inbox us or call us. Contact us on 675 4379. I don't call them, no. Hidden treasures, discovering gems in young minds. Welcome back. Now we take a look at news in the region and around the world. Trinidad and Tobago Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley implored TNT nationals to wear masks covering their nose and mouths. In a news conference on Saturday, Rowley announced that as of Monday, the wearing of the mask would become mandatory or face a fine from as low as 1,000 TT, which is 30,000 Ghana dollars for the first offense, to 5,000 TT, which is 154. 
thousand Guyana dollars for a third offense. Prime Minister Rowley said, quote, unfortunately it had come to that, after indicating that some people were still reluctant to follow the various measures put in place to prevent the spread of the virus that has so far infected 1,577 people and killed 19 since the first case was detected in Trinidad and Tobago, March of this year. He also added, all contact sports will stop and water parks close, as well as casinos and members clubs and cinemas. Also, there will be no gatherings of more than five people permitted, and weddings, funerals, and christenings will only allow for a maximum of 10 people. All public transport will function at 50% capacity, and all travel to Tobago will be on an essential basis. Countries in Latin America are still struggling to bring the coronavirus pandemic under control, with the number of cases and deaths still rising, Al Jazeera's Daniel Schwermler reports. There's been no let-up since the first case of COVID-19 was reported in Latin America at the end of February. Five months on in Buenos Aires, these ambulance workers mourning the death of one of their frontline colleagues. The number of registered infections in Argentina has passed 400,000. It's a similar story across the region. In Peru, these health workers march to demand better working conditions. Peru has just overtaken Belgium as the country in the world with the highest number of deaths per head of population. More than 9,000 workers have been infected due to the lack of personal protective equipment. More than 70 health workers have died. Lack of adequate investment lies at the root of many of Latin America's problems. The inequalities only highlighted by the pandemic with health workers often hit particularly hard. I was a COVID patient. 49% of my lungs have been affected. As an employee of the affected institution, I've still not been paid compensation. Each country has tackled the crisis in its own way. Some, like Peru and Argentina, with strict early lockdowns. Others, like Brazil, emphasising the economy over health. Brazil has just registered 120,000 deaths from the virus, second in the world only to the United States. In far too many places, there seems to be a real disconnect between the policies that are being implemented and what the epidemiological curves tell us. This is not a good sign. Wishing the virus away will not work. Economies showing tentative signs of recovery last year have been devastated by the pandemic. The already vulnerable, like these street vendors in the Colombian capital Bogotá, now barely surviving. Days that we don't work are days that we don't eat and don't have enough to pay for utilities or anything at all. Many countries in Latin America believe their rates of infection will be peaking around now and they begin dreaming about the end of the crisis. That's not happening. The nightmare only continues. Daniel Schweimler, Al Jazeera, Buenos Aires. And internationally, the mayor of Portland has accused President Donald Trump of creating a culture of fear, hate, and division in the U.S. The criticism comes after a supporter of a far-right group was killed on Saturday night. It happened when backers of the president clashed with counter-demonstrators. Al Jazeera's Mike Hanna reports. Anti-racism protests continue in a number of cities across the United States. The new wave of demonstrations sparked by the police shooting last week of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The 29-year-old African-American remains paralyzed in hospital. On Saturday night, dozens of President Trump's supporters confronted protesters in Portland, Oregon. One person was shot and killed in circumstances still to be established. This afternoon, my heart is heavy. The city's mayor insists that President Trump must bear responsibility. It's you who have created the hate and the division. President Trump, you bring no peace. You bring no respect to our democracy. You, Mr. President, need to do your job as the leader of this nation. President Trump spent part of the day playing golf, but only after sending dozens of tweets slashing out at the Portland mayor. 
Trump described his supporters who'd converged on the city to hold counter-demonstrations as great patriots, urging others to follow their lead. His chief of staff denies the president is inciting violence. We've had over 200 anarchists, and they're not peaceful protesters. These are people that every single night uh, conduct violent acts, and, and it is in Democrat cities. You know, you want to talk about Donald Trump's uh, uh, America. Most of Donald Trump's America is peaceful. It is a, a Democrat-led city in Portland that we're talking about this morning. People are getting injured. A 17-year-old self-described support of President Trump has been charged with killing two people in Kenosha in the days after the Jacob Blake shooting. The president is still to condemn the killings and insists he will visit Kenosha on Tuesday, despite the mayor there asking him not to. I think that when you look at the issues that are going on in the community, this community is trying to heal. We're trying to pull together. And I think that at this point in time, it's, it's not the best idea. Following days of protests in Kenosha against police brutality, a small group gathered to express their support for police an indication of the ongoing divisions within this country, which critics contend President Trump is intent on exploiting amid his campaign for re-election. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Washington. That's all for today's regional and international news. Here is your three-day weather forecast. That's all for this edition of Channel 2 Headline News Update. Tune in Wednesday at 7 p.m. for another episode. Be sure to subscribe, like, and follow us on Facebook and YouTube. Or visit our website at headlinenewsghana.com for all the news we couldn't fit in the newscast. Until then, take care.